On here is I'm laying out for the lookouts or outlookers around here they're known as both they have to be located so that the break on the plywood that is installed at the overhangs which is that AC face that a face AC ply plugged and sanded really nice material that we have stacked up here on the scaffolding right now these things have to receive the joints the, the breaks between those sheets we're going to be notching the top of the, this gable end truss, which doesn't matter at all, because the gable end truss is supported all the way along its length on top of this wall. And besides that, there's still three and a half, uh, four inches, four inches left uncut, which would have been enough as a top cord on this truss, except we wanted the two by six just for the appearance. So cutting an inch and a half out of the top of a two by six rafter in a truss is utterly insignificant and is the only way to make the outlooker look out, cantilever out over the edge of the building to support the barge rafter. If I wouldn't have had the scaffolding set up along the side of this building, there is no way that I could have dealt with having sheets of plywood dropped up here by the crane before I even got any of the trusses stood on their feet. And there was a little monkey motion involved with sliding them around and moving them in and out of the work area to sort of coordinate what needed to be done. And some of the sheets are for one side and some of the sheets are for the other. But in the big picture of the thing and looking back, it was definitely the right move. one thing it's often smart to build a jig right so this is a jig that will hold these lookouts to the right distance away from the face of the sheeting and hold them square so that as they project out of the building they are square across the face of the plywood hopefully everything works out fine demonstration of the doctrine of anti-tape and it's this a tape measure is a wonderful tool you can't build a building without it but you don't need to get it out every time often if you look for the opportunity it's faster and more accurate to simply butt the piece in place scribe where the length is going to be and then cut it and neither one of these wonderful tools have to be pulled out at least that time So however chancy or foolish any of the other things that you watch me do from time to time which violate reasonable safety uh, protocols, however sort of vulnerable to criticism those might be, putting this kind of a membrane down on a platform that's up in the air which has one or two holes in it and nasty drop-offs on all four sides, this is dumb. But doggone it, it's dumb leaning a ladder up against a wall and putting this paper on the side of a tall gable end too. And here we are, and so that's why we're crawling around like ducks to do this, because at this point, 
and putting that paper down, and now with a little bit of slipperiness, but not bad, it sort of elevates the whole level of concern for what's going on up here. Man's got to pay attention. However much I try to camouflage it, two or three guys are, in fact, faster than one. And if I would have had them here for the last period of time, we would have gotten this up and dry before the rain came. As it is, we got a little rain last night, and worse, we're getting a little rain right now. So we're just going to go easy, because we can't wait, but we can be careful. So we'll just pay attention and see how this turns out. So I didn't quite have the geometry figured out on this. And that 16 foot 2x4 that I'm crawling that jack up, I knew it was short, but it's a little shorter than I was hoping. I gave up some space with that rope connections. There's no fixing it now unless I hold the wall where it's at, which I'm going to do, and then experiment with just pushing it up by hand, which I think I can do because I have my third son, Clayton, here with me, sort of backing me up in case Mr. Murphy overpowers my planning. And uh, the two of us, I think, can easily tip this up because it's a lot lighter now than it was 30 degrees ago. Well, we made it. And I don't know if you could tell it or not, but it was just a little bit more than I thought it was going to be. Here's what it looks like. That four by six is doing its job, but it didn't want to go out the last portion of the distance. And I didn't have the presence of mind to realize that it might have been because that barge rafter was rotating around and pushing down on the scaffold pretty hard. Now not hard enough as it turned out to actually hurt anything, but it wasn't the way it should have been, I can tell you that. So I'm going to take a sawzall and buck the end of this off so there's clearance and there, this scaffold plank under my toe here is not taking way more load than it's supposed to have and everything will hopefully come to rest in a nice neutral plumb straight position. So we're now ready to actually get some work done. The trusses are fanned out within six inches of where they need to be on their layout on the wall. The gable end is up with the outlookers, the lookouts in place. So the first truss that I stand up will go up against the outlookers. It'll have it on the right layout. And then the rest of the trusses will just be blocked off of, that is spaced off by the blocks that I'm going to nail at the peak, intermediate in the rafters, and then the eave block will be nailed to the side of the truss so it'll be in the right spot when it's time to nail that in. This is where this sort of a solo stacking technique really can pick a guy up some time. So these are the vent blocks. Relco supp supplied these. They've got some kind of a giant dado and then they just pop some hardware cloth in there. Makes a pretty good vent. You know, that's a little ratty. I mean, you can see the sort of slivers from the end of the cut. I see that they tend to be like that, but it's a long ways from the ground. The key is you want enough vent blocks to get air circulation in the attic, because in the same way that air circulation in a crawl space promotes decay, air circulation in an attic is important. So overkill the blocks. In general, and I'm going to get this number wrong, I think you want one 150th of the square footage of an attic or a crawl space vented that amount of vent space, I'm not sure that's right, but more vents are always better than fewer. And so I'm gonna see if I've got enough to go 
every third cell, every third bay with a vent block. I think I've got at least that many. So a more standard way of rolling trusses is to have three guys. One on each end of the truss, one guy out in the middle, walk the trusses down the building, set them up. The guys at the end, you know, verify placement on layout, it's toenailed down and the blocks are put in later. There is a one by four that is laid out, two foot on center, that is nailed to the top of the trusses as they come to hold them in place and the three guys work their way on down. What you've watched me do here is prep the top of this building for all of the trusses to be put up one at a time without worrying too much about their placement on the walls because that can be adjusted with the peak blocks and on these trusses, the intermediate blocks in the position they're in later. I'll show you. Can you see how the bottom cord, this long tail cut, it has just a little bit of a plumb cut there at the end, is lined up oh, within less than a sixteenth of the outside of the framing. It's the same on the other side. That's where these trusses have to come to rest in order for the roof to be flat. That means that this truss, the first one, which is going to raise up and go against these lookouts, needs to be exactly in place left and right, and the lookouts will hold it in place up and down. So I've got a couple things going on here. First, my platform in there, my temporary scaffolding and shoring to build that gable end flat is holding a couple of these up a little bit out in the mid-span. I'll tear that out, they'll settle right down. Second, if you remember when I pointed out when I was balloon framing these walls that I was using the fire blocks to establish the layout on the studs, well that's a good way to go. About every fourth or fifth block you check the layout and if you're gaining or losing you fix it. So I'm checking that on the roof, and I've lost about three sixteenths or a quarter in one, two, three, four, five, six, six bays. Now that's not much, but it's enough to fix. And the reason I lost it is because these guys did such a great job on the trusses. Everything's flat, everything's in a plane, the gang nails are out of the way of the blocks. So the net one-eighth um, distance that I allowed in the blocks is just a little too much. I should have made it a weak eighth short and then I wouldn't have to go back and correct. But when you're too short, it's easy to correct it. Just like this. You might remember that I lived and worked in Las Vegas as a young man from 1986 to 1994. And for two or three of those years, I worked in the housing tracts, piecework framing, layout, stairs, and roof stacking mostly. It was a high production, high intensity learning experience. And in one year, in just one tract, a tract called Crystal Bay, I stacked 164 houses using exactly this method. It's funny though, it seems like it was just a lot easier back then. I didn't show you Clayton and I moving these trusses around. I didn't quite get them loaded perfectly and it took a little help to shuffle them out, but we've done it. We have the gable end laying here pretty flat and everything else waiting to be put in position. I'm doing kind of a blend between just putting up the gable end and then sheeting it in place and roofing it in, in place and doing what I can on the ground like I did the last time. And the reason I'm changing the approach a little bit is that other one was heavy. And I don't have anything to lift off of right below me here except standing on the catwalks and I just don't want to try that. So we're going to sheet it, put the lookouts in and stand it up.
couple things I want to show you. So I ripped this off an inch and a half above the plate because that's the distance from the edge of the table on the saw to the blade. So an inch and a half straight cuts easy to make using the plate as a, as a guide. And I put this an inch and seven eighths. Now two inches would have been just as good because the last thing I want is to raise that gable end truss all sheeted up and find out that these two pieces of plywood are interfering with each other and keeping the truss up off of the crown plate. Shipwreck. Have to lay it down. That's dangerous. So a three-eighths of an inch gap all the way along the front of this thing does nothing negative because it's tied together by both sides nailing to the bottom cord of that truss right there. So we'll put a good nailing pattern right along there and tie everything together. I've got a similar condition right here where I ripped the plywood off the top of the truss. I do not want that plywood sticking up and holding my sheeting up. So I snapped the line a little short of the top and made sure to cut it even a little short of the line. It is so much better to give yourself room to operate than it is to pull something down and have to redo it again. There's something else I want to show you, a couple of items. Reasons that these trusses are exceptionally well built, um, thoughtfully put together. Besides the fact that the members all fit, you know, the cuts are all nice and everything's straight. The lumber's good quality. Besides those elephants in the living room, I want to show you how careful they are with their gang nail placement. So these sheet nails or gang nails are what are holding everything together on these trusses. And it's easy for truss manufacturers to be sloppy with the placement or have them bigger than they need to be so that the edges of the gang nails stick up into these voids so that when you pull your cord through a hang-up or your hose you cut holes in your cord or your hose these guys have them all exactly placed to where there's maximum flexibility and they even went so far as to up here at the peak which is a very very critical connection can you see that they held it down from the top a little over three and a half inches? That's so a peak block can toenail directly into the top of that truss without glancing off of the gang nail. It's just, it's just a little extra touch that means so much. And when you find somebody that does something like that, you gotta stick with them. For Kelly and I, one of the greatest blessings of our lives is the fact that three of our four kids have moved their families back to Roseburg over the last few years. It's an unexpected and frankly almost unhoped for blessing. And so, because of that, Clayton is saving me here with this heavy lift today, just like he did on the other end of the building yesterday. So sadly, I didn't have the camera running, but just a few minutes ago, I cut off a little upright that was coming right out of the corner right there. I cut it off so that it wouldn't tangle up by any means with what we were doing with this truss. What I forgot was the GoPro that I'm looking at right now was clamped to the top of that post and it went right to the ground. But I think if I would have caught that, it would have made a pretty good commercial for the durability of the GoPro Hero 9 camera. Thank you, GoPro.
So this would ordinarily be considered a subfascia because that kiln dried dug fur is not the same material as this S3S spruce, which is pre primed and is used for fascia and barge rafters. But the reason I'm using it is I'm using a fascia gutter. I mentioned that earlier back when I was reviewing the plans, I think. And I was going to hang the fascia gutter right on the end of the rafter tails, which is reasonably legitimate if you're using 5 8 roof sheeting. But the existing house, when I look closer, has a subfascia. So I'm putting a subfascia on here. It gives a nice wide substrate for kind of pressing the gutter up against. It keeps the roof sheeting from ever dipping in between the rafter tails. And it adds one more level of complexity for an old guy up here working by himself. Nothing wrong with that. Maybe you've seen me talk about this Rufus. It's a great tool. I switched from the speed square to the Rufus as soon as I got pretty well done crawling around inside of those rafters. Because this will hang up and the speed square fits nice and tight. But in general, when you start cutting angles and roof pitches and almost anything else that's slower and trickier, I've never seen the equal of this thing. It is terrific. In the next video in this series, this thing's going to suddenly look like a shop because we'll be finishing the barge rafters on the front and sheeting the whole roof. Besides that, you're going to get a look at a product called Tiger Paw. It's a synthetic roofing underlayment that's nailed directly to the substrate. And I got to tell you, just like some of you have told me in the comments on earlier videos, it's a big, big improvement over old fashioned tar paper. Thank you for watching Essential Craftsman and keep up the good work.